good morning and happy new year, everybody. It's good to see you. I want to invite you to open your Bibles this morning to the book of Acts. And uh, if you're here for the first time, you've come on a really, really good day. And if you're here for the 1,000th time, you've come on a really, really good day. Because we're going to start a series uh, which will kind of define the next several months uh, in the book of Acts. We're going to be in the book of Acts for, well, uh, I don't know how long. Maybe a really, really long time. Uh, but it's good. It's a phenomenal book. And we're going to learn a lot about the early church. And we're going to learn a lot about what, uh, how they were empowered by the Holy Spirit and how the gospel spread throughout the, the world. And, and we want to tap in to what they were doing so that we can do likewise. We want to be a church that's empowered by the Holy Spirit, that is full uh, and ready to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I'm really excited, and I want you to get excited uh, about this series through the book of Acts. Now I'm going to read uh, just verses 1 through 11. But through this message, we'll refer to the entire first chapter. Um, but we're, 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 we're reserving the right to come back to the first chapter, maybe even next week, because uh, I just don't know how long it's going to take us to get through this book. Uh, but we're going to have a great time as we go through it. Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they, gave, then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. <coughs> men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Let's pray. Almighty God in heaven, uh, just like the men of Galilee were standing by looking to the eastern sky, looking to see where Jesus was going, we today are still waiting, Father, with a great anticipation of his return. And, and Lord, we thank you for the book of Acts uh, that you inspired through Luke to, to pen these words and to help us to understand how the Holy Spirit-empowered church took the gospel to the known world. And Father God, that, that command that Jesus gave us in Matthew 28 to carry the gospel to all the nations is still with us today. And so Lord, as we wait for our Savior to return, as we look to the eastern sky for the sky to part and Jesus to come again, Father God, help us, Lord, to be faithful in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ to everyone we know and meet. In Jesus' name I pray. <coughs> Amen. So like I said, we're probably going to be in the book of Acts for a really, really long time, and that's okay. It's a phenomenal book. It's a wonderful book. 
And so today is a, is a way of introduction to the book of Acts, but I don't want to write it off as an introduction because there's a lot that we're going to learn today uh, about what it meant to be the church in the New Testament, those early days for that infant uh, church. And the theme uh, of the book of Acts is through the Spirit, the church bears witness to Jesus in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So, so that's kind of the general theme of the book of Acts. And the context of the book of Acts, it's a narration. It narrates the events of the early church as written down by Luke, a companion of Paul in the late first century. And so, so we'll just start with that. Who penned uh, the book of Acts. Now we know that it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. In fact, all scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. But it was penned by Luke, and Luke, as you know, was a companion of the Apostle Paul. Interestingly, they met in Troas, where Paul received that famous Macedonian call, where he was going to carry the gospel even further uh, to the west. He received that famous Macedonian call, and it was in Acts, uh, in Troas, in Acts chapter 16 and verse 10, where we begin to see Luke beginning to use phrases like us and we. And so up until Acts chapter 16, Luke is just narrating uh, and using eyewitness accounts and, 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 and all of that. He's just narrating what happened for the early church. But then in Acts chapter 16, we see that Luke actually joins the group. He joins the party. And we begin to see him using phrases like us and we. And that's how we know uh, where Paul and uh, Luke met. It was in, in Troas. Uh, Luke, as many of you know, is a physician, but he was also an historian. He was a Renaissance kind of man before the term <laughs> Renaissance man was ever even coined. He was very versed. He was intelligent. He was educated. He was uh, methodical in his thinking. Uh, Luke holds the distinction of being the only non-Jewish author of any book uh, in the New Testament. He was a learned man, obviously. Uh, he was analytical in his thinking. He was very careful with his approach. He had verified and recorded everything that he wrote through many eyewitnesses. Luke uh, is writing this second, uh, this is like a, uh, a sequel, you know, Luke, the Gospel of Luke was the first part. Uh, by the way, there's like 19,000 words in the Gospel of Luke, and there's like 19,000 words in uh, the book of Acts. And so Luke writes the Gospel he writes to Theophilus, uh, which literally means God lover. We don't know if that was sort of a, a covert name for somebody who was actually funding Luke. It cost a lot of money back then to write uh, a book such as this. Uh, a scroll would be like 35 feet long, parchment paper, very expensive. And so that holds about 1,900 words, uh, depending on how small you write, I guess. And uh, the Gospel of, or rather, um, the Book of Acts also holds about 1900. So you got this long scroll, Luke, and then another long scroll. So you got the prequel and then the sequel, the Gospel of Luke, and then the Book of Acts. And he uh, wrote a lot, but he was very, very careful with the details uh, that he used. Uh, in fact, uh, listen to the opening, if you will, of the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And it kind of tells you the kind of approach that Luke uses when he's recording this historical account of the life of Jesus Christ and then subsequently uh, the, uh, early, the history of the early church. He says this, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who, from the first, were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, 
I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So the Gospel of Luke records all that Jesus accomplished from his virgin birth, his perfect life, his death, his burial, his resurrection and ascension. And in Acts, Luke records all that Jesus continues to do through his church. And so Luke is about Jesus, but just as much as Luke is about Jesus, Acts is about Jesus. It's all about what Jesus began and continues to do uh, through his church. Now, another interesting truth about the book of Acts is that it is indispensable among all of the New Testament books <coughs> of the Bible. There is so much that we would not know regarding, for example, the means of salvation and the structure of the church if it were not for the book of Acts. If somehow we lost one, two, or even three, three of the Gospels, we would still know enough about Jesus to know that he is in fact the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that his death served as a sacrifice for our sins. But without the book of Acts, we wouldn't know the New Testament plan of salvation. After Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, how did people come uh, to know Christ as Savior? What did they do uh, in response to God's offer of grace through faith in Jesus Christ once the gospel was preached to them? Without the book of Acts, we wouldn't have the names and addresses of people who actually encountered the apostles and the preaching of the gospel and then consequently what they did in order to be saved, in order to come into this saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And one more uh, important and perhaps the most important feature of the book of Acts is the role of the Holy Spirit in the church. Three times in these first 11 verses, the Holy Spirit is mentioned. It's called the book of Acts because it was coined as the Acts of the Apostles. But really, it's only some of the Acts of some of the Apostles. Really, it's an account of the Acts of the Holy Spirit that Jesus had promised to the church. And watch how the Holy Spirit works through the church to carry the gospel to people all over the world. Acts has been called by some the gospel of the Holy Spirit. The fulfillment of the promise that Jesus made to his disciples in the upper room and continued to command them after his resurrection. Now in John chapter 14, uh, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit to a very forlorn, very sad, and very distraught group of disciples. Um, they were distraught at this announcement. Jesus said that he must go. Now I want you to put yourself in the place of those disciples. They had left their homes. They had left their jobs. They had left their former way of life to follow Jesus. And for three and a half years, they followed at the feet of Jesus. And now, this Jesus whom they love and who give, they gave their whole lives to him and says, I'm going to leave. They were distraught. They were forlorn. Uh, they were saddened greatly. And it was at this very moment in the upper room, when Jesus promises them that it is good for me to leave. Now, can you imagine that? It's good for me to leave. How could it possibly be good for you to leave, Jesus? And Jesus says, because if I leave, when I leave, the Father is going to send you another, the promised Holy Spirit. So in John chapter 14, verses 15 through 20, we read this. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commands. 
And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will see me no, no more. But you will see me because I live, you will live. On that day, on that day, on what day? On the day the Holy Spirit comes. You will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. And so there's the great promise to uh, assuage the, the distraught nature of the, the apostles at that time. I'm going to send, the Father's going to send another, a comforter, an advocate. And so then in Luke chapter 24, after his resurrection, he reiterates this promise and he gives them further instructions to actually go somewhere and to wait for the promised Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 44, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead. And on the third day, and repentance for forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Later in Acts chapter 2, the promised Holy Spirit does in fact come as Jesus promised. And so what Jesus began to do, he will continue to do through a Holy Spirit-empowered church. And I want to say that the infant church was mighty in power. The infant church was a powerful church. I came across a word that I hadn't given much thought about until I went through this study. It's amazing. I don't care how many times you study the Bible, something always new pops up, and it's just wonderful. It's living and active Word of God. And I came across this word in regards to this question. What can we learn from the early church in regards to spreading the gospel? What can we learn? from the early church. And in that study, I came across this word, presidency. Now, I'm not talking about the U.S. president. I'm talking about a different usage of this word. Presidency is a condition or state which believes one's rank is greater than others. And in context to this topic, that word presidency was used because it is held by some that the modern church is somehow greater than the infant church because it's been around longer. And I want to say to you this morning that the contrary is true. The early church had greater power. They had greater faith. They had more uh, uh, childlike faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and they were obedient without question. They just followed Jesus. He said, go to Jerusalem and wait. And guess what they did? They went to Jerusalem and waited. Uh, and so the early church had a simple childlike trust when everything seemed to be sprinkled with the dewy resurrection freshness. Jesus was alive, made for 40 days. He appeared to them. He, he fellowshiped with them for those 40 days, gave many convincing proofs to those around him of his resurrection. And he fellowshiped with them, and he ate with them, and he talked with them. And, and so the early church had this, this freshness of the resurrection. And they were holding on to this promise that 
Jesus, in fact, would send the Holy Spirit. I pray that this newness in this new year will be ours. To this end, let us look at some of the features, if you will, which characterize the members of the infant church. And let us ask ourselves whether we, his sheep, have the same marks on us. All right? So number one, they were in fellowship with the risen Lord. Our text says that he presented himself to them and he was eating with them. Uh, the resurrection was unquestionable fact to them. You know, you got you to gotta come 2,000 years uh, ahead in history to start questioning whether or not Jesus actually rose from the dead. They didn't, they didn't question it. Uh, they saw him. And Luke was very careful to record that there were eyewitnesses and all of the testimonies surrounding the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was dead in the tomb. And three days later, he rose again. He had now become their very life. They had each personally experienced his power and his presence, a presence with not one unbelieving person experienced. Now, for us today, individually and collectively, uh, we need to seek every opportunity to fellowship with Jesus. They were hungry for fellowship with Jesus. They wanted to spend time with him. We need to have that same kind of desire. And we can experience his presence in many ways through the power and indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. We can experience his presence when we pray for others. We can experience his presence when we read and store up his word in our hearts. We can gather together in love and fellowship and experience his presence as we come together in peace and harmony with other believers. And certainly, we can experience His presence when we meet around the table of remembrance. Secondly, they receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in our text that you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. This great promise of the Father is made to every heaven-born child of God. Every one of you can receive the power of the Holy Spirit in your lives. We'll read later in this series how on the birthday of the church, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit manifested himself with great power, signs, and wonders. And on that same occasion... The Holy Spirit led Peter to preach to the crowds that day, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive what? <clears throat> the gift of the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine being there on the day of Pentecost when tongues of fire seemed like they were coming from heaven and sounds of roars and there was just this manifestation of the Holy Spirit? Uh, and you were a follower of Christ, maybe you were in that crowd of 5,000 that were fed, and you, you hungered once again for that newness of that relationship with Jesus Christ, and you were in Jerusalem on that day, and you knew that the promise of the Holy Spirit had come, you would desire to be a part of that, wouldn't you? And they were that hungry for that. And so on that day, as Peter preached, he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's uh, Jesus knew that it would be impossible for these disciples of his to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world without the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, it, it, it's 2,000 years later, and we, we, we've got all kinds of ideas on how we can carry the gospel. What we need is the power of the Holy Spirit to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ. It, it's not about us. It's not about our abilities or what we think we can do or uh, some uh, method. It's about the Holy Spirit living, working, moving in us to carry the gospel to a world 
in need of Jesus Christ. I've heard it said, and I know you'd agree, it's impossible to live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit, without the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Equally true is this, it's impossible for the church to live out its charge without the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want to say this morning that we need a fresh wind of the Spirit to move across this place. Third, they were obedient to his word. They were obedient to his word. In verses 12 through 13, the Bible says, they returned, then they returned unto Jerusalem and went up into an upper room. The Lord had told them to wait for the fulfillment of the promise. So they had come to do just that. He said, go and wait. And guess what they did? They went and they waited. They didn't gather to discuss the manner, the time, uh, or the extent of the promised outpouring, but the way. Uh, they had made up their minds simply to do their master's bidding and leave the rest to him. There's a lesson right there for us, isn't it? Just do what Jesus says to do and leave the rest to them. We need to do the same. We don't need more committees. We need more commitment. We don't need more programs. We need more power. We need less obstinance and more obedience to the Lord Jesus and his word. Fourth, they were united in the spirit. Verse 14 says that they all continued with one accord in prayer and in supplication. In our presidency, the modern church is weak, not strong. We are not united in the spirit as citizens of Christ's kingdom. There's a church on every corner, most of them in opposition to the rest. Do you realize that there are nearly 200 denominations in the United States? Now, in math, you have a numerator and a denominator. What does the denominator do? It de what? It divides. Yeah, guys, wake up. There you are. It divides, right? And so denominations means divided. Uh, we are not united. We are divided as a church. 200 denominations all claiming some distinctive that separates them from the others. We are a divided church. You think 200 denominations in the United States is bad enough? Do you know how many denominations there are worldwide? 45,000 denominations. All claiming that I'm not like them, I'm like this, and they're not united, they're divided. Jesus and his word have a lot to say about unity. Jesus prayed that we would be one as he and the Father are one. Paul wrote, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. The Scriptures pose this rhetorical question, Is Christ divided? And the answer is, of course not. Jesus isn't divided, and He wants the church to be united. The infant church was more powerful and more effective because they were united. <clears throat> they had all things in common. They were together in prayer and in fellowship and devotion to the apostles' teaching and to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and to the Lord's Supper and to the gathering together uh, on the Lord's Day. The infant church was more powerful and more effective because they were united. Now we have not the ability... And we can't do much about the church on the corner, but we can be united right here at Director Christian Church. We can be united right here. We don't need to be divided. We don't need to have sex of people and groups of people. This one likes this, the other one doesn't. We need to come together as a church if we want to be effective. Unity was a hallmark of the early church. Can we be of one accord? Of course we can by allowing the Holy Spirit to guide us in the ways of Jesus. Love is the way of Jesus. 
Forgiveness is the way of Jesus. Mercy, grace, peace, joy. Do you know where all those things come from? The Holy Spirit. In fact, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22 and following, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and what? Self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Christ is not divided. The church doesn't need to be divided. And we can be united in the Holy Spirit. In fifth, they honored the scriptures. Verses 15 through 20 speaks in part this. Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be filled, fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David. Peter and the 119 that were gathered with him had no difficulty at all as to David being the author of Psalm 69. And that he spoke prophetically under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We need to return to the authority of God's word. You know, one of the, the first sin in, in the Garden of Eden was to question the word of God. We need to come back to the authority of God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16, all scripture. Some scripture? No, all scripture is God breathed, is inspired, is theopneustos, is breathed out by God, and is useful for teaching. Yes, for rebuking. Yes, for correcting and training in righteousness. You know, the Word of God doesn't only tell us how to live, it also corrects us. And a lot of times, church discipline has gone out the window. But the discipline doesn't come from an individual, it comes from the Word of God and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do you know who is responsible for the Scriptures? Do you? God? More specifically, the Holy Spirit. That's exactly right. It's the Holy Spirit that claims responsibility for the scriptures. Listen to 2 Peter 1.21. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We call in the question, the word of God. Guess who you're calling in the question? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is responsible for the scriptures. The infant church did not question the word of God. It was a settled matter. And I suggest that we go forth, this day forward, with the authority of Christ and his word as a settled matter. And finally, aren't you glad? Number six. <laughs> they brought their difficulties to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Verses 21 through 25. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time Jesus was taken up from us, for one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph, called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. Two men were named to fill one office. Both of them were quite willing to set aside their individual preferences and accept whom the Lord should command. As it was then, so it is now. Only the call of God will succeed. 
So let me um, close with this. Quite frankly, the early church was mightier than the aged church of the present day. Not for lack of power or purpose, but because many have moved away from the faith once delivered to the saints. And I suggest to you this morning that we need restoration. Let me give you six quick things, and I mean quick, that we need to restore. Number one, a pristine fellowship with the risen Christ. Number two, a fresh empowerment by the Holy Spirit. Number three, a childlike faith in Jesus. Number four, a sincere commitment to unity. Number five, a renewed acceptance of God's word. And number six, a genuine trust in prayer. Brother Bob, if you'll close with a word of prayer.